next period, which some people make it through and other people don't, and, and you know, you, 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 you're existing together, and then you move into that latter period of, of life together where you're, so you, you see how that could happen, where you have different stages, but in all of that, it's relationship. Well, that could happen the same way when you're looking at it in these letters, the different ages or, or uh, um, stages of spiritual life. So you can look at it either way, and both of them kind of work, so I just want you to keep your mind open as we move through. Now, the first letter is the church at Ephesus. What do we know about Ephesus? Well, Ephesus was a, a huge town. It was um, a place where Paul ministered for three years, and Apollos, uh, I mean, uh, uh, Priscilla and Aquila were, were both in service, as was Timothy. So we know that place had rich, deep foundational teaching, right? I mean, real rich foundational teaching. We just studied Ephesus not long ago, and we know that they had good foundation. Listen to what Jesus says. Now, it starts out, these letters start off, and to the angel of the church of. Now, there's two ways of looking at that, too. One is that there's a spiritual being there who oversees the church and the, and. The, the question I always had in the commentator that I was reading also says, why would Jesus say right to a heavenly being? Because the heavenly being is always in contact with the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So that didn't really make sense. This angel, this overseer, is really more the pastor, the bishop of that group, of that church. So right to that leader. And then he says this, these things saith he, meaning Jesus, that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. So John's writing this uh, instruction, or this letter, out to um, the people there in Ephesus. And we know that was in, in modern-day western Turkey, that was in that, that particular region. And there were temples throughout this area. One of the temples, one of the main temples there was the temple to Diana that was referenced uh, and other scripture. And in the temple of Diana, the primary method of worship to the goddess Diana was immoral sexual behavior. That was their way of worship. So there were very corrupt people in their, in their mindset early on. But they were a religious people. Okay? Keep that in mind. They had no problems worshiping. And offering sacrifice and, and doing things. They had no problem. That was part of their culture to worship. How did they worship? So that was a big thing. When these people converted and accepted Christ, now their worship, their fervor, the, the attitude they had in worshiping these other gods, these other deities, these other methods, they channeled that into worshiping Jesus. And so they, they moved into that uh, very quickly. There was also a temple there that um, it was a temple to Artemis, which is where the, they, they worshiped with their money, which is not uncommon in a lot of places today. But they came in and offered their money. It was like a central bank in the temple of Artemis. So he's writing this. says, the angel of the church here, uh, he's saying, it, well, I guess I need to pull my scripture back up because it's not out, it's written out here. Sorry, I meant to do this earlier. But he's writing to this to this leader, this overseer in the church of Ephesus, and he says, I know, now Jesus, Jesus is saying this, I know thy works. Now that, we could stay and just spend time on that. He knows what you do. Everybody else may not know. Everybody else may not appreciate. Everybody else may not care. But he knows. He knows, and he tests it. We'll find that out too. But he knows your works. He says, and by labor. Now that word labor here does not just mean to work. It means to work to exhaustion. To spend all you have. Well, I felt yesterday, after we, we got done, I'd given, I didn't have any energy left, none. 
Sometimes that's the way uh, the, these Christians will go out and labor for, for the Lord. Giving all the head Spurgeon said, a lot of people's labor was not enough to exhaust a butterfly. Now, there's a lot of Christians in today's church that their labor for the Lord wouldn't exhaust a butterfly. But these people weren't like that. He says, I know your labor and your patience and how thou canst bear them which are evil. These people, did they couldn't stand evil. They put it away. They hated evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not and has found them liars. So they're deeply rooted in good doctrine. Okay? Deeply rooted. Because what we say, Paul taught there for how long? Three years, right? And Timothy ministered there, and Aquila and Priscilla ministered there, so they had good doctrinal foundation. That was not a problem for them. And so they know how to test those who come in and claim to be of God and are not. So how do you do that? Let me ask that question. How do you test to find out if a preacher or a teacher is preaching the word? How do you test it? How do you test it? Know the word. What way? By her fruit. fruit. By fruit? Know the word. Know the word. Excellent. Yep. So when you're in tune, when you're in tune with God, you're going to be listening and testing it against the word. And you're going to watch. You're going to watch that fruit this morning because it, a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Yeah. Can't happen, right? So what we're doing here is, is they're saying, you're so rooted in good doctrine and in the word, I can tell whether or not you are teaching and preaching the true gospel of Jesus Christ. That does not happen in a lot of churches today. People are so ignorant of God's word that when a lie is preached, when a false doctrine is preached, they don't know it. They accept it. They tolerate it. We'll get into that in a little bit. So that's a real issue, isn't it? That the church has fallen so far away from the study and the, uh, the absorption of the word. That's why this kind of thing is so important, to study the what does it mean and how do I apply it in my everyday life. And he says, uh, and has born and has had patience for my name's sake and has labored, has not fainted. So Jesus is complimenting this church at Ephesus. I mean, really complimenting. You have not stopped. You know what to do. But nevertheless, that doesn't take away your failure. So we can stop again right here and spend a lot of time. You can do everything with all your might and all your power and still hear him say, not well done, but nevertheless, I have something against you. Mm -hmm. That terrifies me. It terrifies me. But because you can give all you have labor with all your might, and it's still not right. Why? Listen to what he says. I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love. Mm -hmm. You left it. You didn't lose it. If you lose something, how do you go find it again? You don't know where it's at, right? I lost it. Yesterday, I lost a chain. I couldn't find the chain. I thought, I, surely I had it in the bucket of my tractor and dumped it in the fire. I looked everywhere. Well, I found it, but I lost it, right? But when you leave something, I know exactly where I left it. I made a conscious decision to leave it. They left their first love. They didn't lose it. They left it. Because they went and did all these good things, but they left the attitude of love and compassion and charity behind. Now let me ask you this. You all here, you're studying and absorbing and studying God's Word. Tell me another group of people that were fervent and on fire for pure doctrine and doing the right thing but had no right attitude. Pharisees. The Pharisees. They were known for knowing the Scripture. They did everything exactly like 
They thought was exactly, and they did it with fervor. And I mean, they pursued those who did not with anger, didn't they? Look how Paul went after the church. He hated them because he felt like, well, they, they've turned this, this uh, prophecy of the Messiah aside and, and they've embraced this false doctrine and we're going to go torture them and imprison them and kill them. And it's all good and it's right, right? They were wrong. And so Jesus is telling the church of Ephesus, listen, you're doing all the right things, but I have this against you that your attitude is wrong. Your motivation is wrong. What he's saying to us today is if we want to do all of the right things that will please him and take away the nevertheless, we don't have love. We don't have the right attitude. We're wasting our time. It won't be blessed. And it won't be recognized. And instead of well done, you'll hear, nevertheless, I have this against you. You see what I'm saying? We can spend a lot of time just on this thing here with the church at Ephesus. And I've, I've outrun a whole lot of my, my notes here. These works that, that Jesus knew. He said that he's holding... He held those seven stars, stars steadfast in his hands. That reference there in the original Greek means to possess so tightly it cannot be pulled away. These seven stars were held by him. These are Jesus' churches. Okay? They're not the churches of the angel of the church. They don't, that's not who they belong to. They belong to him. And a lot of times you have people who are both pastors and people within churches, this is my church. Only what I approve is going to get done here. And they're not thinking about what he wants. So our entire attitude, our entire approach to worship and to a church body has to be, God, show me what pleases you, and that's what we'll do. But now you have people chasing programs and ideas and thoughts and attitudes to say, Oh, I know what's going to please him. But have you asked him? Have you asked him what will please him? Because what he wants us to do and how he wants us to do it is the only thing that will please him. So they're commended for all this stuff. Then he, he, he gives them the rebuke. So they left the attitude of love. The attitude of love. Did they leave the love of God or did they leave the love of each other? What's your, thought? What's your thought on that? Attitude of God, the love of God, or attitude of love of each other? Okay. Got one says each other. One says love of God. Can I tell you, you're both right. Because they're just like this. They're just like that. Because here's the thing. In this walk, if we love not him, we can't love each other. And if we don't love each other, we've rejected him. It don't, you can't separate the two. That's the thing. And so they lost, they left, not lost, they left that love behind. And so that's what caused this problem. They were a doctrinally pure church. Obviously. Except for that thing that they left, their love. And then he goes on to say this. But this you do have, you hate the work, and I can't say this word, I've tried it, tried it, tried it. He says, but thou, hast, thou hate, hatest the deeds of the Nicolotians, which I also hate. Now, who were the Nicolotians? Well, they were the followers of Nicholas. How about that? But Nicholas, his teaching was an indulgence, an indulging the flesh. The indulgence of the flesh, eating food sacrificed to, God, uh, to idols, and immoral behavior. That was the deeds of the Nicolaitans. So listen to this, though. Think about what he just said. I hate you, Nicolaitan. That's what Jesus said. For God to say, I hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, that is heavy. That is major for God himself, Jesus Christ, the Savior of all who is the embodiment of love to say, I hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. 
I don't know. I don't know if you can get worse than that. But he's saying, I'm going to give you this, Ephesian church. You hate those deeds, and I hate them too. So he goes into that and he says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit hath uh, saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give thee uh, to eat the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. So now we're, we're moving on, and we're, he's saying, if you have ear to hear, in other words, if you're willing to listen, not if you have the ability to, that's not what he's saying. If you have the willingness to listen, hear what I've got to say. And if you go back and pick up your love first and then go do all those things, you're going to be good to go. So Edible Church, no matter what you do, if you leave the love that he requires of us behind, it is a waste. It's a waste. So then he says, if you do these things, I'm going to restore you back where you belonged in the beginning, which is in the garden, in the paradise of God, to eat of the tree of life. In other words, you get the eternal life that you were intended to have from the very beginning. You get that. So then he moves on to the next letter, the second church. How did it? Okay. Smyrna. The next church. I found this to be very interesting, too. I have to admit, I got goosebumps on this one uh, when I was studying it. Uh, I didn't know much about Smyrna. I, I admit, I didn't know very much about Smyrna. But Smyrna was a city located about 40 miles north of, uh, the, of Ephesus. It was a city of about 200,000 people. And in this, it was a major trade route. Um, it was the center of emperor worship. I did not know that. That was the center of emperor worship. In fact, in that particular area, uh, what they wanted was to find, uh, they required their citizens to burn incense to, uh, to the emperor. Just a little bit. You had burnt incense, offer an offering to the emperor. It was the center of emperor worship. And in that particular area, uh, if you didn't burn incense to honor the emperor at least once a year, you would be put to death. Now you got a Christian group in this city. Where are your alliances? What did what did the Ten Commandments say? Thou shalt have no other god before me. No other worship to anybody or anything, because God's a jealous God. Yeah. So he's speaking to the church at Smyrna who's under threat of death by not burning incense to the emperor. So listen to what he says. Write these and say, he says, under the church at Smyrna, uh, under the angel of the church in Smyrna, write these things, saith the first and the last which was dead and is alive. Now this is where my goosebumps came in. Remember, he's, he's referring back, he always refers back to himself, a piece of his character in these introductions. So he's saying, I am the first and the last. I was the one that was dead, now I'm alive. Right? So Smyrna gets its root word from the word myrrh. Myrrh was a sweet-smelling perfume used to embalm bodies. So what he's saying here is, hey, Myrna, Smyrna, you sweet-smelling savor that used to embalm bodies. I was dead, but now I'm alive. <laughs> and he says that about himself to these people because they, that's going to get their attention, right? Yeah. Now they know the root word of their city. I'm the first and the last. These are titles that only apply to the Savior. Only apply to him. And he goes back and he says, I know your works and tribulation and poverty. Look at what it says there in parentheses. But thou art rich. Uh -huh. And then he goes on and says, But I know the blasphemy of them that say they're Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Now, notice he didn't say, but are of the synagogue of Satan. Everyone says, 
They are the synagogue of Satan. Satan dwells in them. And then he goes on to say, Fear not of the things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil hath cast some of you into prison, that you may be tried, and you shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. So again, Jesus is saying here, you, and this word for poverty is not just, I, I don't have enough, or I don't have as much as I want to. This word for poverty is destitution, having nothing. And he's saying, I know that you have poverty, destitution. But then he says, but you're rich. Rich in what? Those spiritual things. The things that matter. Now, here's the owner of cattle on a thousand hills, of all the universe. And he's telling them, you're rich. But what he's doing here is giving them a tremendous compliment. A tremendous compliment that they are rich in spiritual things. So that again, a very, um, a very large compliment. But he also talks about the blasphemy that were the Jews who claim to be Jews, but really are not. They are the inhabitation. They are the synagogue of Satan. Now, the fulfillment of the Jewish faith, the prophecy, the covenant, the, all those things that was given by God to Abraham, that fulfillment is Christ. So to be a good Jew, you follow it all the way through, right? Because that was the promise that was given, that the Messiah would come and would restore the right relationship between the Jew and God, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek, everybody else. But it was promised through the Jews that that blessing would come. And so what he's saying is these Jews, they're not really Jews. They've allowed Satan to take over. And he's saying that to them, don't be afraid of them. Because they want to put you in prison. They want to torture you. They want to kill you. Don't be afraid of them. He's giving them, listen, this is not, this is not a little pep talk. He wasn't saying uh, this is the way of, of uh, you know, how to win friends and influence people. That's not the kind of pep talk he's talking about. He's saying, you're going to find out, you're going to be in prison, you're going to be tortured, you're going to, some of you will be killed. Don't worry about it. I got you. I've got you on this. And he says here, go down, he says, uh, Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Now that's a definitive statement, isn't it? Not that you might. Yeah. You're going to suffer. Yeah. So are you, and you, and you, and you, and you, and me. We are going to suffer if we walk this walk. Because we are no better than our master. So we're going to suffer. Now, there's, a, there's a, a thing here. I want you to go and read it sometime when you can. And there is a very specific time period here. He says 10 days. Now, some people say, well, that's the literal 10 days. Others say it's uh, some, somebody come up with some weird mathematical thing. And it's kind of like the prophecies of Daniel where they come up, they carry the one, and they multiply some more. They come up with a whole bunch of days. Some people said it was 10 emperors and actually list off the period of emperors. We don't know. We don't know if it's 10 literal days or 10 emperors or some weird math. We don't know. All we know is God ordained that it will happen for a specific time period. No less, no more. So God says, I'm placing an end on your suffering. Just like I placed the beginning. Nothing happens, but he allows it. But I want you to go and read up on this. I found an interesting, interesting study on uh, Polycarp. I referenced it, uh, I don't know, a week or two ago, uh, a couple weeks ago. Uh, Polycarp. I couldn't remember his name uh, because I got studied ahead for this reference to Polycarp. But it's very interesting because he was 85 years old. He had been the, the, the pastor of a group there in this area. Um, he, again, this is known through the, the uh, records of tradition about Polycarp, uh, his martyrdom. But Polycarp, you know, I said they had to burn some incense to the emperor. 
Polycarp was had fled. He tried to get away, and, and according to <coughs> according to writings and tradition, he had a a dream, and he dreamed, and basically God told him, "You're going to burn for me. You're going to be burned at the stake for me. You need to get back there and, I, and do your job." So they wound up taking him into custody. They bring him back. He's a little 85 year old man. They didn't bring him back, and they said, "Hey." Yeah, we don't want to do this. We don't want to bring you in here and take you over here and have you try to put you to death. We don't want to do this. Just take a little pinky incense, go over there, burn it, just be done. And he said this, 86 years have I served Christ. He has never done me wrong. How can I blaspheme the king that saved me? I'm not going to do it. Not even a little bitty pinch because that brings dishonor to his name. He's never done me wrong. I will not dishonor him. So according to tradition, they bring him up and put him up there on the stake. Now, this is a different account as I read when I was studying it. Cause I, I take off on rabbit races whenever I start studying because I'm oh, this is interesting. Let me go find out all I can find out about this. But according to tradition, they put him up there and they started to burn him. And the fire wouldn't get close to him. It wouldn't consume him. So they got angry, and they stabbed him with a spear, and his blood come out and extinguished the fires. Yes, he died. He still died, but as another witness, you can try. You know, as another witness, I don't know how much that's accurate. Here's what I do know. The example here is this: a little leaven affects the whole lump. Right. A little bit of Compromise right. affects us Not all. Does, yes. yeah. So that's a warning. And it says here, He that hath ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. And he that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. What is the second death? Hell. Hell. He's saying, you'll overcome and you're not going to face that. The second death will not hurt you. But what's the flip side of that coin? Life. Well, yeah, but if you, if you don't embrace it and overcome, yeah. second death is yours. You earned that one. You earned that one. And then he goes into the angel of the church, church of Pergamos, uh, and he says, Rightly saith which hath, uh, saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. Now, where is where have we heard that again? Some other place. The sharp two-edged sword. God speaks his word. It's like a, yeah, Hebrews tells us, you know, it's like a two-edged sword. It cuts going and coming, right? So this two-edged sword, who's the Word? Jesus Christ, right? He was with God. The Word was God. The Word became flesh, right? He is the Word. He is the sword. But he's saying, I'm speaking these words here to, to the church here. And this uh, Pergamos was the citadel. It had been for 300 years the, the regional capital for Rome. So again, very powerful city. In fact, they say that this city was so large, it had a library that had over 250,000 volumes in it. That's a huge library by today's standards. But it had this, um, this, this area in here. It says, again, he says, I know your works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. In other words, this, this center of, 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 of emperor worship and temples and all that stuff. Um, it's where Satan says, it says, And thou hast not denied thy faith, even in those days where an Antipas, my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwells. Now, we don't know anything else in Scripture about this martyr. He's only mentioned here. But he must have died among the people in their sight, because he's, he's mentioning them, right? Antipas, my faith, my, my faithful martyr. Now, again, we can spend a lot of time on little points here. Here's the point. The whole world never knew anything about Antipas. But he did. He knew exactly the price he paid as a faithful martyr. Nobody else may know the suffer, suffering you endure for his name, but he does. Right. He not just knows about it, he knows you by name. Yes. And he called his name out and he said, my faithful martyr. 
the one who gave himself for me in this horrible place where Satan dwells, this horrible, evil place where Satan dwells. So according to tradition, again, I told you I like to chase my So I tried to find out what, who was Antipas. So what tradition says that he was martyred by being roasted in the belly of a brazen bra or brass bull. Uh, he was roasted to death. And the, Ro the Roman emperor Domitian was the one who did it. Now, there's a lot of detail for a myth. But according to that, he was placed in this belly of this bull and roasted as a martyr. Slow, agonizing death. He would not recant. Praise God. How much would it take you to give up and say, I deny, I deny. Yeah. I'm afraid before the end happens, there are going to be those in the church that are going to have to face a decision. Do I give my life or do I compromise? Burn a little bit of incense, or maybe deny. Here's, here's what he says in his review. Well, let me let me go on here. He says, uh, "I have a few things against thee, because there, uh, thou, because thou hast there them that hold to the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balaam to cast the stumbling of the block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed to the idols and commit fornication. So thou hast also them that hold on to the doctrine of the uh, Nicolaitans, which thing I hate second time." When Jesus says, I hate those things. Repent or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. So here he's saying, you've got this doctrine of Balaam as a stumbling block. And he says, if you don't repent and turn away from that thing, I'm going to come to you and you're going to suffer because of, this is what he says. He says, uh, Repent, or I'll come quickly and will fight against them, those people who are holding on to that doctrine, with the sword of my mouth that cuts coming and going. Right? Then he goes on to say, uh, He that hath ear, let him hear what the spirit uh, of the churches say. To him that overcome, I'll give the, uh, to eat of the hidden manna. And will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that received it. So, I find this very interesting because there are other places in scriptures where stones mean specific things. I remember the breastplates of stones that were placed, one for each of the tribes, uh, that were placed on the ephod of the, the priest, and you know, they each had a specific meaning and they had a name inscribed on them, each one for the, the tribe that represented. Well, here he's saying, I'm going to give you this stone. It's not just a stone. What kind of stone is it? A white stone. And white means pure. Right? It's representing the purity that comes from Christ. That stone comes to them. Right? And he said, I'll give you that. I'll give you that stone, that white stone. And upon it, what's on, what's on it? Name, new name. A new name. And nobody knows it but the one who receives it. Now, I was mentioning earlier about relationships and everything. Frequently people get in relationships and you come up with pet names for each other. Sometimes just, you know, it can be a, a pet name, you know, it can be something weird or it can be a shortened part of your original name or something because I often, I call Melissa Liss all the time. You know, and I know Dad calls my mom, her name's Gladio, and calls her Glade. I mean, you have these little pet names that you come up with. You know, sometimes they're not very nice. But they're bad names. Sometimes you come up with that person that you're in a relationship with. He's saying here, I'm going to give you this white stone and it's going to have a name on it that's my pet name for you. Because I know you. I have a relationship with you. Yeah. You're mine. And I'm coming up with this, uh, giving you this as a relationship. Now what does a white stone mean in antiquity? I love history. What does white stones mean? mean and antiquity. Well, not just white stones, but certain jewels and stones. They could be an invitation to a banquet, which is your, your ticket in. It could be uh, to signify that you've been counted among the number, so that you came in. It's kind of like giving you a token 
So they, they would make up these, these stones, and, and you know, that way when you came in, you had this to show that you've been counted. Another one may be an evidence of being uh, of, of, of friendship, you know, that it was a gift unto, unto you. It can also be showing that you've been acquitted of a charge in, in a court of law. All of those fit here. All of them fit right here. Yes. And this is something that was their practice of the day. You see, you can't tell me that God's word, I mean, the little minutia that we read over sometimes, when you dig down in there and you study, you think, oh, man, this blows my mind. Because what he's saying is, you're my friend. You're coming to the marriage feast and to this banquet. You are, uh, you, you are, are being counted as one of my sheep. And you've been acquitted of all those sins that you committed. All those things fit right here with a stone. Man, this is good stuff. And he says, here and now we've got to move on to Thyatira. So this is the smallest church, the little bitty church. They were about 45 miles due east. Now, if you look on a map of the seven churches, it goes up and over and down southeast. It kind of makes that in these this churches in Asia, Asia Minor. It says, to the angel of the church of Thyatira, right? These things saith the Son of God. The only place in Revelation that that is used. That's referenced and alluded to several times, but this is the only time Jesus refers to himself as the Son of God. He says, saith the Son of God who hath his eyes like into a flame of fire and his feet like into fine brass. Again, going back to the description of Jesus in chapter 1. So he's saying, I'm writing to you. Now, it, it doesn't get any better than this. The Son of God is writing to you. Yeah. <laughs> Just in case you wondered who the author was, it's the Son of God. I'm writing to you. He says, write into this. He says, I know thy works and thy charity and service and faith and thy patience and thy works. And the, the last is more than the first. In other words, these later things you've been doing are even better than the first things you did. Man, wouldn't it be great if the Lord looked at the, at the church in Enoch and said, you're better now than you were when you started. Yeah, yeah, you're getting better. Man, now, what a compliment it was. And he says here, um, i got my, I got to move on here. Blah, 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 blah. Okay. And he says, but, yeah. notwithstanding, I have a few things against you because, listen, you sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calls himself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit fornication and eat things sacrificed to the idols. I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Whew. Trying to hurry to get all this in. Listen, here's what he's saying. Whether this woman's real name was Jezebel or not doesn't matter. It was the Jezebel spirit. Right. Mm -hmm. And what he's saying here is you have, listen, church at Thyatira, I know all your good works and all this, but you're allowing that to happen. Right. Again, a whole day, a whole study of, the, of this thing right here. Church, we cannot uh, allow, permit sin in our midst. Right. We have to address it. You cannot suffer it and allow it to take place. And here's why. It will be a nevertheless, I have something against you. My God. Evil church of God. Because you've allowed this sin in my house. And he says, listen to what he said. I gave her plenty of chance to yeah. repent. And she rejected it. She's rejected it. I'm holding you responsible for allowing it, but she's rejected it. And then he goes on to say this. He say, uh, the this judgment that's going to come, he says, Behold, I'll cast her into a bed and in that, uh, that commit adultery with her in a great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And he says, I'll kill her children with death, and the, all the churches that know that I am he that searcheth the reins of the hearts and will give unto every one of you according to your works. <clears throat> but unto you I say unto the rest of thy power, as many as have not had this doctrine, in other words, of all those who called sin, sin, and not put up with it, or engaged in, in her with it, because she claims to be a prophetess. She's claiming to be for me. Listen, there's people sitting under the ministry of preachers today who are preaching lies, right. and they're, in, they're engaging it, and there are those in that church that know that he's preaching the wrong doctrine and will not say anything about it. 
I want to address it. And so then he says, as many as not had this doctrine, and which have not known the depths of Satan, as they speak, I will put un upon you none other burden. In other words, I'm not holding you accountable because you have rejected it. You have pushed back against it. But that which ye have already uh, that which ye have already hold fast till I come. I gotta got wind it up right here. Listen, you gotta call sin sin. Amen. You cannot tolerate false doctrine from the pul pulpit right. or from the Sunday school table. Right. It can't happen. No. And if we do, if we do engage it, we are gonna be guilty right. unless we repent. Right? So these these Four messages today have a common thing. Have a common thing. Are we searching ourselves? Are we searching ourselves to find out are we pleasing to Him? And how do you search yourselves? Dig in the Word, get on your knees. Because it's the only way we can know from the Spirit, am I in right standing? Because we can fool ourselves real easy yeah. that we're okay. Real easy. But what we have to do is get in His Word, compare our life under the magnifying glass of that Word. And until we do that, we're going to be, we're going to be guilty of this. I have something against you. And we do not want to be in that place no. at all. Thank you for being in Sunday school this morning. Study uh, next week. We have the last three churches, and uh, it's a bit intense. <laughs> So, we made it through. Thank you for being here.